So, Mort Halperin, tell us about your role in the creation of the Pentagon Papers. Papers. Well, I was in the Defense Department uh, working for Bob McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense, and my immediate boss was a man named John McNaughton, mm -hmm. and I was his special assistant. I was sitting in my office one day when the phone rang on my desk. There was a two-way line between me and McNaughton, but it only worked in practice one way, and he said, come in here. So I went into the office, and there was McNaughton, and a, then a colonel named Bob Gard, who retired from the military many years ago as a lieutenant general. And Bob, who I'd known for many years, was a special military assistant to McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. And McNaughton said to Gard, repeat what you just said to me, Colonel. And Bob Gard said that he was down on a mission from Mr. McNamara, that he wanted prepared an encyclopedic history of the Vietnam War and wanted us to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I started asking questions, you know, which period, how much detail, did he want just documents? And to every question, Bob said the same thing. This is all the secretaries told me. He wants a memo from you about how to get this done and then he will review and approve the memo, and then he wants you to go forward with it. Hmm. And God left, and McNaughton said, okay, draft the memo. So I drafted a memo to McNamara, which I actually is in my papers in the LBJ library. I was just there a few weeks ago, and I actually saw the memo again. Wow. Um, and the memo said that we would assemble a team of all people who already had clearances, because we didn't think there was time to clear anybody, and that we would do an encyclopedic history, and we needed to be based in McNamara's own office in order to get access to documents. Mm -hmm. And that we thought it would take, I think we said three to six months, and actually took three years to- Three uh, years? To finally get so, it. Maybe it's two, two or three years. So you're finally. having this in 19, what, 65? No, six? no, 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 six. It was finished in 69, so this was in uh, 66. Seven or 60, 67, 68. 1967, 1968. 68, yeah. And you were in your 20s at the time? Or you were, uh, you I were was, still you were quite young? I was born in 1938. So, okay, so, so that's I was 30. 30 right? You were 30. I was 30. And that sounds like a huge task to take on. Did you understand, A, the import of what you were being asked to do, and B, the motive that that Robert we, McNamara had. We knew nothing about the motive, and to this day I know nothing about the motive. What do you mean to this day you know nothing about the motive? Uh, I don't know why Mac, what McNamara thought he was doing. I think, as, as the film suggests, he was doing it, I think, out of some sense of guilt and some sense of we have to make sure that future leaders don't make the same mistakes again, which of course they have over and over again. Um, mm. And so I think it's not clear that doing a history helps you avoid making the same mistakes again and again. Did you um, actively work on building that well, what happened was body of work? McNamara, we sent the memo up to McNamara, and the last sentence said, it was from me to him, since you consider this so important, I will spend full time. Or maybe it was from McNaughton, and, and it said, Dr. Halpin will spend full time on this project. And McNamara said, he proved the memo and said, except that he wanted me free for other things, so we should get somebody else to work on it full time. So I appointed um, a man who worked for me named Leslie Gelb, and he became the full time director of the of the study, but I was deeply involved, especially at the beginning, in helping to recruit people to work on the study, in uh, helping to persuade various parts of the Defense Department to give us the documents that mm -hmm. we needed. And then- Your expertise was in, was it was as a military historian at that time? I mean, I know you have- I was trained as a political scientist. I have a PhD in international relations, mm -hmm. and my field of expertise as an academic was nuclear, nuclear strategy. And so I was in the Pentagon working on uh, arms control issues, on Vietnam, and on U.S.-Japanese relations, and a number of other things. But, mm -hmm. So I was sort of, 
a military strategist and bumped into the group of whiz kids, as we were called, right. and working uh, with uh, the best with and Mackinac. the brightest. Right. Yes. As, you, as we used to call, <laughs> right. we used to call your generation. So, yeah. what in in the compiling of the Pentagon Papers, did you come to some kind of crystallized understanding of the war, the history yeah. of the war that you didn't have previously? Yeah, I, I did, uh, but I didn't actually get it until after I left the government because I was just too busy to read the Pentagon Papers. So I, they were piling up on my desk because I had said, you can't put these in final until I read them and approve them. And of course, in final then was a big deal because it meant retyping the whole document because, you know, we didn't have computers. And finally, Gelb came in one day and there was a big stack on my desk. And he said, we have to start putting these in final. You have to let go. So I said, well, I'm clearly not going to be able to read them, take them and go. So they were continued after the end of the Johnson administration. And then the summer after that, the summer of 69, I went out to the Rand Corporation mm -hmm. where we had famously put a copy of the Pentagon Papers mm -hmm. and read them. And Rand here in Washington, D.C.? No, Rand in Santa Monica. In Santa Monica, Monica. okay. Yeah. Um, where the rap is based, by the way, but okay. Where, yeah. That's where yeah. our publication right. is based. And where, of course, as the movie shows, Ellsberg read the papers right. and copied them. And, right. You know, although and is it, it's depicted that way in the movie. In, in the movie. With some odd, it's a little bit random that Rand would be in Santa Monica, California. Rand is but, in Santa Monica. But it is in Santa Monica, like, California. But there's that scene in California where I'm sure a lot of viewers will be like, why California? But, right. Yeah. And it's sort of unclear because when you... You see Ellsberg in the Pentagon, and then the next yes. time you see him... he's in California. He's in, and you don't know that he's in California. Right. It looked like he was... I thought they were showing him getting them from the Pentagon. So there was this was girl in line with a hippie hat on. Right. So. Yeah, then <laughs> it becomes clear that it's the... So... So you were then... So you I left went government, out, went to the Rand Corporation. Well, no, I went to the Brookings Institution, but I was a consultant to Rand, and okay. I arranged to go out to the summer after I left the government, the summer of 69, uh, uh, and read the papers and was startled by them in a way that the movie actually portrays very accurately. I mean, the summary of what's in the New York Times on the first few days gets it absolutely right. What the papers show is that at critical moments in the history of the Vietnam War, the American government, including the president, consciously lied to the American people about what was going on. Um, going back to Harry Truman and the decision by the United States to help the French retake Indochina, because when the Japanese pulled out, Ho Chi Minh seized control, and the French did not have the capacity to go back in on their own. Mm. Truman made the decision to go in, but he had been told and the Pentagon Papers make this very clear. He had been told that Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist, the leader of Vietnam, yeah. was a nationalist, that he was not a tool of the Russians or the Chinese, that he was not subordinate to them, that the Declaration of Independence that he had issued quoted at length from our Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. and that he was eager to have good relations with the United States. Mm -hmm. The CIA said that absolutely clearly. And, but Truman was also told by people who advised him on Europe, that if we did not help the French to go back into, into China, there would be a crisis in France and the communists would come to power in France. So the reason we helped the French back into Indochina was to prevent the communists from winning an election in, in France. France. And everybody in the US government understood that. Everybody understood we couldn't say that was the reason, so Truman said publicly this was the fight against communism. We were in Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asia with the Sino Soviet bloc was using Ho Chi Minh as its agent to take over Indochina and then all of Southeast Asia would fall. Nobody believed that. It was not what he had been told. He said Ho Chi Minh was not a nationalist. So that was the first lie and it was a Were you first of all, was that news to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. As a scholar. Yeah, I had, well, I hadn't really. I was a scholar of nuclear strategy, so I knew about. I had not studied in right, China. but you were more but, uh, educated than the average American. I think almost, except for people who were there at the time. I don't think anybody 
anybody knew that. So that's the one big lie. And then a second was when we introduced ground troops into Vietnam, we said publicly we are doing this at the urgent request of the South Vietnamese government. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the South Vietnamese government was bitterly opposed to it and said it would totally undermine their credibility to have American forces there. We went back to them and said, we will pull out unless you let us send ground combat forces in. And not only that, we have to say we're doing it at your urgent request. It was a total and complete lie. And then the Gulf of Tonkin. This was to establish American an American ground the, presence the, to to, introduce, as, as part of the domino well, theory? Well, it was, it was the, the, you know, the, the most momentous decision of the war was that we would start fighting the North Vietnamese and the South Vietnamese communists with U.S. ground forces. Up until then, we were in there helping right. the South Vietnamese army. Sounds like some yeah. other conflict. Well, of I've course, heard it's of. exactly the same. It's just, and each case we misunderstand. We don't understand that the people we're fighting are the dedicated nationalists, and the people we're trying to get to fight on our side are in it for the money or just to advance themselves. And we're we're on the wrong side. I mean, I think that that was for me so, the fundamental so you, lesson of Vietnam. Did, so, did, when you finally did read the Pentagon Papers, which you supposedly oversaw. Right. In the su summer of 1969, which, right. by the way, a few other things were happening in the summer of 1969. Right. It's quite a momentous time uh, in general. Did it turn you against No, I had turned the against war? the war. I had been originally for the war. Mm -hmm. Came into the government from Harvard in 1966. The last thing I did at Harvard was to debate whether we should be in Vietnam with a man named Norman Thomas who you may know was the Socialist Party candidate for President of the United States mm -hmm. in about six elections and was a dedicated opponent of the war. I defended the war. Between 66 and 67 I was the period in which we introduced ground combat forces and I came to understand, just reading the newspaper, that we were on the wrong side and couldn't win the war and that we did not have interests at stake that justified what we were doing, which was a build-up to 500,000 So troops. at this point, Daniel Ellsberg is also at the RAND Corporation, that same Well, I'm in the time? Defense Department. You're he's, in the Defense Department. He's you back at RAND. Summer. Okay. I Did spent, you know him? Was he a colleague of yours? He's yeah, I met Dan in 1961. I went out for the first time to visit the RAND Corporation and met a number of very distinguished people who were there studying nuclear strategy issues. And one of them was a guy named Dan Ellsberg, and he and I became friends and have been friends to this day. You are friends to yeah, this day? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so when the Pentagon Papers were leaked to the New York Times, you came under suspicion by the Nixon White House as potentially being the person who had done this? Oh, yeah, when I ended up working for Ellsberg's defense team at the trial, and I testified on his behalf at the trial, and when I went on the stand, the prosecutor went to all the reporters sitting in the courtroom and said, this is actually the guy who masterminded this. We just don't have enough proof to indict him, but he's really the person who should be indicted, which was not true. It was not true. It was not true at all. But the no. government believe, believed all the way up to yeah, that the, time that you were the person right. behind it because you and Ellsberg were friends or because well, you were more it, it politically was, it was active? My, or? It was my copy <laughs> of the Pentagon Papers uh, that Ellsberg had. What happened was... Okay, say that, that again. Daniel Ellsberg, w say that again. <laughs> then the copy of the Pentagon Papers, which Ellsberg s s took out of the Rand Corporation, photocopied, and then eventually ca they came to the New York Times, uh, was a copy that belonged to me and Leslie Gelb and Paul Warnke. What happened was when the papers were finally finished in the Nixon administration, Mel Laird, who was the Secretary of Defense, said, this was a McNamara project. I don't want to have anything to do with it. You guys tell me what we should do with it. So we said, well, we should put copies in various places. So we put a, gave a copy to the Secretary of Defense. We gave a copy to the Secretary of State. We gave a copy to the National Security Advisor, who was Henry Kissinger. Gave, of course, a copy or two copies, maybe, to Bob McNamara. And then we decided, it was me and Gelb and Wunke, 
uh, who would replace McNaughton, that we should give ourselves a copy. And the question was what to do with it. And I had put my papers from the Johnson administration, which are now in the LBJ library, in, uh, in the Rand Corporation. And so I went to the president of Rand, a guy named Henry Rowan, who's heard on the, in the movie. I don't think you see him, but you hear. Mm. Um, and said that uh, I would like to store a copy of the Pentagon Papers. Of course, he didn't know what it was. I explained to him that it was a documentary history of the Vietnam War. And we said, but it's still very closely held, so you can read it, we said to Rowan. But nobody else at Rand can get a copy, can read it unless we, two of the three of us, Gail, Wonky, and Hop, would give permission. And Rowan agreed to that. Mm -hmm. And then he called me up and said, I want to give Dan Ellsberg access. And I said, Harry, because Henry Owen was called Harry, are you crazy? If we give him this, he's going to leak it. And How did you know that? I, because I knew he was against the war. I knew he would do anything that he thought would help end the war. I knew he was a great believer in information making a difference to people. And he thought, I was sure he would think, if if people will see all the lies, because uh, by then I knew what was in the papers, if people see all the lies, they will turn against the war. So we, so I checked with Gelb, and he said, of course not. And I checked with Monkey, and he said, of course not. So I went back to Rowan and said, Ellsberg can't have access. He said, well, I'm not happy about that, but okay. And then he called me two weeks later and said, this is not acceptable. Dan Ellsberg has a top secret security clearance. He's working for the Rand Corporation on a study of the lessons of the Vietnam War, which is a Defense Department study. He has a Defense Department top secret clearance. The Defense Department is giving him access to current top secret documents. How can you guys substitute your judgment for the government as to whether he's trustworthy and should be given a clearance and access to classified? It was not a bad question. I said, but Harry, you know that the government security clearance process is totally broken. They never discover anything real. And he said, well, if, if I can't show it to Ellsberg, I can't justify storing it at the Rand Corporation because it costs a lot of money to store top secret documents. And if we can't use it for a government project, you're going to have to come and get them. So I went back to Gelb and we decided that we should defer to the government's view that Dan Ellsberg was uh, was trustworthy, and we gave Rowan permission to give them to Ellsberg. So, of course, when the Times published them, I mean, this discussion in the movie about does anybody know who did this, I, I knew who did it instantly. You knew yeah. immediately. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was not the slightest... Uh, right, and but slightest. it also had the knock-on effect of bringing you under suspicion because it was your copy. Yeah, which I didn't occur to me at the time. I didn't find out until much later that... Uh, that. In fact, I think the first time I may have found that out is when I testified. And the reporters said to me, you know... That is incredible. The prosecutor is saying you're really responsible for and, this. And you went on to be on Nixon's enemies list right. as well, right? right? Right, Is that related to just the basic suspicion <laughs> that surrounded Yeah, I your views? was... Uh, well, they had... They had wiretapped. You know, I, when I worked, oh, that was the other piece. Yes, yes. they'd wiretapped you worked, illegally, right? Yes, illegally. Yes. I worked. I went to work for Kissinger, who I had known at Harvard when he became the National okay. Security Advisor, mm -hmm. and they bombed Cambodia, mm -hmm. and the New York Times had a front page story saying that Cambodia was being bombed. Very few people knew anything about it. It was a secret campaign. I mean, it was at a the secret time. bombing. Right. I knew about it a little bit, not everything that was in the story, but some of it, mm -hmm. and so I was suspected of leaking the story. And so I was wiretapped. And I think I got on the enemies list because of what they read in the wiretap. So you had all, all, all the misery and none of the fun of getting to be a top secret the, leaker to yeah, the press. Right, right, Unless right. you'd like to share no, something. No, no. Uh, <laughs> so I th for example, they, what says, it says next to my name on the enemies list, uh, top executive at Common Cause, uh, which was a thing that a man named John Gardner had started. And I had taken leave to help him figure out what to do about Vietnam. But then it said a scandal would be helpful here, next to my name. 
Yeah. Who do you know who wrote that? We think Colson did it, but I don't. Charles Colson. Charles Colson, but I don't really know. Um, so I think I got on the enemies list because of what they were hearing on the wiretap. I was involved in various anti-Vietnam War activities at Common Cause, and I was working for the Muskie presidential campaign. And they picked up. I mean, the most serious thing they picked up was conversations with me and other people about what Muskie should say about Vietnam. So how did all of this, uh, I'll just call them dirty tricks, you know, illegal mm -hmm. activities, how did it affect your view of government since you had given yeah. your best efforts in years to the government? And Rand, of course, is a government think tank right. anyway. Um, right. I mean, I understand you weren't based yeah. there, but still, I right. mean, and then, you know, reading the revelations of the Pentagon Papers and then Well, the Watergate. short answer is that I spent the next 18 years working for the American Civil Liberties Union. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was important that people who had been in the government, who had security clearances, who understood how the national security process worked to help people defend their civil liberties as the Nixon, Nixon administration did two things. One, it gauged in dirty tricks. But the other is, as again, we saw in the film, it went into court. The, 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 one of the re remarkable things about the lawsuit that the government filed against the Times and then against the Post was it was not only the first time the government had ever sought an injunction against material that was in the hands of the press, it was the first time in the history of the country that the government sought the use of the courts to enforce its view of what should be kept secret. Up until then, it had been understood that presidents could try to keep things secret. Mm -hmm. People would leak things. Reporters would, as they always did, check with the government to make sure there wasn't anything super sensitive there. And then they would print what they got. Mm -hmm. And this was a break in that process, which has gotten worse and worse. I mean, the Obama administration indicted more people for giving information to the press than all of the other presidents right. put together. James Risen. But the, the Ellsberg oh indictment God. was the first time in our history that a former government official was indicted for giving information to the press. On the, using the espionage laws, which is about giving information to enemy foreign powers. And I thought and still believe that that is extraordinarily dangerous, uh, that the chilling effect on what the public needs to know, given how much is still classified, uh, is, is a great danger. And I decided I should do what I could to help push back on that. So do you regard um, the Supreme Court decision, ultimately, which supported the New York Times and the Washington Post's right to publish the Pentagon Papers as a good thing, but not decisive, because there's still uh, well, a first, lot. Uh, there's there's still a lot of prosecution um, that can happen. The decision is much less of a victory for free speech than people think, for two reasons at least. One. They went, judges went, the justices went out of their way to say, we are not saying this is not a crime which can be punished by using the Espionage Act. And I think a majority of the judges, at least, left open the notion that, well, prior restraint had a much higher standard, which had not been met, uh, that that this may well be a crime and people could be indicted for it. And then, of course, Ellsberg was indicted, and there was nothing in the Pentagon Papers' decision that Ellsberg's lawyers could use to say, well, the Supreme Court said you can't do this. All they dealt with But the was, Post and the Times were not prosecuted. Yeah, but they could have been. But they could have there, been. In other words, there was nothing in the decision that said that not only the government officials, because the statute applies both to people with authorized access and people without it. So is action. this then, are, so then are the dilemmas and the challenges that are posed by this film and the decision of Catherine Graham and, and, and of the New York Times, by the way, to publish yes. um, in the face of an injunction, in the face of whatever legal risk, is that, um, is, is, that, is, is that a moral rather than a legal choice in some ways? Well, it's still, I mean, I think it's still the same as, well, it's, in other words, the Supreme Court decision did not affect that issue at all. If anything, 
it made it worse. The issue of, of whether, whether to they, publish or not. Whether you could be subject to criminal penalties for right. publishing. Right. It's, and I want to come back because it didn't really settle the prior restraint issue either. But on the criminal penalties, it said that criminal penalties may be appropriate under the First Amendment for this. And we face that to this day. The Times and the Post every day now are confronted with should they publish something, and if they do, will they be indicted and convicted? And the answer to the question of is this a crime, the answer is now much more clearly yes than at the time of the Pentagon Papers decision, because at that point, the government had never convicted anybody. Now there, are, I think, there have been now three or four convictions, or guilty pleas, of people for providing information so-called classified information to the press. So we're in much worse shape on that issue, and we now have had four different presidents who have done what Nixon did to Ellsberg, brought a criminal prosecution. So what's your view of so where we are today, then, under a Trump administration who has quite a hostile relationship to the, to the press? I mean, I think that if something is printed that they don't like, they easily could go to court and it would be very hard to argue that... Well, they seem to be finding something they don't like every day. Yeah, but they haven't... Not every minute But there the haven't, been, they haven't been publications of national security-related information. I mean, they've been by the president. He's revealed a lot of things that had made people crazy. Well. But, but if we get to that and people look at, you know, the choice that has to be made... People think the Supreme Court decision solved the problem. It did not. It made the problem of do we risk criminal prosecution for doing this made it worse, not better. The argument, the counter argument, of course, is that national security, as opposed to other anonymous, in, in, anonymous source information that might come out, the national security is a special matter because it puts the lives of Americans at right. risk, or it may, you know, it may, it may endanger the nation, it may endanger um, our men and women right. who are on the battlefield somewhere. Is that not a valid argument? Oh, it absolutely is valid. Argument? And it's always been the case that the press, and up until the present, if they get something that looks close to the line, they go to the the government and say, we have this information, mm -hmm. we're thinking about publishing it, we will of course not publish it if it placed lives in jeopardy. And the, they engage in a dialogue. That was true before the Pentagon Papers and it's been true since the Pentagon right, Papers. Right, except that at, at, at some point the publisher has to decide right. whether the government's just right, saying it, that it will put lives right. in danger or exactly. whether it actually does. Right, because <laughs> the decision given the First Amendment in my view, has to rest with the press, not with the government, because the government will always exaggerate the danger. The government, you know, went into court in the Pentagon Papers in the civil case and said there will be grave harm to national security. The truth is they haven't read, they hadn't read any of it. And also, mm -hmm. the Pentagon Papers were classified top secret. Mm -hmm. And do you know what word most often appears in conversations among government officials before the words top secret? No. Only. As in, this is only top secret, meaning it's not really serious. Because... <coughs> it's only top secret. What's the classification on top of that one? Well, the, 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 the answer to that question is I can't tell you because they're all secret. <laughs> and even, in fact, <coughs> it was the case then. It's not anymore. The fact that these other classifications existed was also classified. So you couldn't tell You anybody. couldn't even know. But, for example, there are classifications about satellite... Uh, cameras, which were very secret a long time ago. They're not obviously anymore. Mm -hmm. used to be a secret that we had satellite cameras. There's cl classification for uh, agents' identities. There's classification for communications identities. The kind of stuff Snowden released all has several code words on it in addition to top secret. Um, and so anything that's really serious is protected beyond top secret and that's why people say well that's only, only top, top secret, secret. Right. what when you saw the film what what was most striking to you about it and sort of what was the most significant thing that you think that the film has to convey well it conveys in in a burst 
what's in the Pentagon Papers very accurately and very strongly. And that I, I found to be the most impressive uh, thing in the, in the film. And then there's, of course, the agony of the decision, which I find in a way bittersweet about that is that people think we settled, the Supreme Court settled that issue, we won that fight. And we haven't won the fight, not only on, uh, on whether they can be criminal indictments, but even whether there could be an injunction. Because the court did not say, given the First Amendment, uh, you cannot enjoin the publication of information which the press has acquired. It said the standard is very high, and there were a number of different opinions, but basically it said the government has to show uh, that this would surely inevitably result in irreparable harm. Mm -hmm. But since then, there have been a number of Supreme Court decisions about the, the court's role in effect second-guessing the government, the government would say, about harm to national security. Mm -hmm. And those cases suggest much more deference. If the government says there will be grave harm, the courts have to accept it. So I think the Pentagon Papers decision on prior restraint is no longer good law. Uh, is no longer good, good law. law. Right. And that if, if, I mean. If it came down to it, you think that the White House would, could. Could sue and could win. Now, what prevents that, of course, is the internet and. And, the, and all the holes in the internet. I mean, <laughs> I mean, what you saw, in, you know, it sort of, it seemed medieval. I'm sure to current generations, the film seemed medieval, you know, dial telephones, people getting on <laughs> extensions of phones. Right. But also the Chiseling printing. Chiseling the Pentagon the, Papers in stone. The that printing of the slow. newspaper, right. And, yes. the, and the release of it, and then it's three hours later, you know, it appears on the right. street. And I remember during the Watergate that came, you know, afterwards, we'd go down to the Washington Post and stand outside, because that was the first place you can you could get a newspaper. But now, of course, if you got the Pentagon Papers, you'd have them electronically, as yes. Snowden did. Yes. And you could make 12 copies in a minute and put it on the internet in 10 seconds. So right. I think what protects us against prior restraint now is not the law, but the technology. Technology, technology. Sort of where are you today, sort of in terms of your concern about the First Amendment? Um, and you have an interesting, you sit in an interesting place because you come from government and then you went to work for civil liberties. Um, and you then I went back in the government. And you went back into government and, and academia, obviously. But you're, you're not in the press, you're not a member of the right. press. And, right. and so I'd be especially curious to hear your point of view about where, where yeah. are we today with the First Amendment and are you concerned? I am concerned because I think there's a danger that um, we will have a confrontation and that this administration will go after the press. And it's very busy uh, changing the composition of the court. And so I think you easily could get a court decision upholding uh, criminal penalties for reporters. You know, the Obama administration came very close to it with with uh, the issue of whether he reporter would be compelled to reveal his sources. And the James Rison right, story. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that was, mm -hmm. in my view, unforgivable. Um, but this administration would have no qualms about not only doing that, but going the next step of indicting the reporter. Because under the statute, if a, if a government official is guilty of a crime, giving a classified document to a reporter, the reporter is guilty of a crime for receiving the document. There is no difference between those two in this wording of the statute. Uh, and I think the courts might uphold Are you talking about the crime. Espionage Act, that statute? Yeah, or? that's all there is, is the espionage. I mean, I've always argued that it's the Espionage Act is about espionage. But, Doesn't you know, it seem like a crazy thought? No, but we now have a number of court decisions saying it can be used in situations where the allegation is that a government official gave information to the press. And that's a disaster. And it's been Democratic as well as Republican administrations who have done that, thinking, you know, we'll always have people who are reasonable in the White House. And we don't. Well, those are very strong cautionary words. So I hope uh, we all take the lesson from that.
Thank you so much Not for your all. time. Happy to do it.